Welcome. I'm your host, Conrad Chua, and a happy Lunar New Year for those viewers celebrating this weekend. Before we get started, if you're new to the show, you can put your questions in the comments field, whether you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn. You can start by writing down where in the world you're watching this from today. Now, on the show, we've covered disinformation and the media in several episodes last year. We had Professor Alan Jagalinza talk about the impact that disinformation can have on businesses. And we had alums talk about how the print news industry that they were part of was so disrupted by Google. Today's guest will talk about broadcast news. Before becoming Master of Selwyn College, Roger Mosey spent more than 30 years at BBC News and Sports. He was editor of the Today program on BBC Radio 4, head of BBC Television News, and director of BBC's coverage of the London Olympics. He's seen firsthand how the BBC transformed itself and also the challenges it continues to face. So welcome, Roger. Hello. Hi, Conrad. Hi, everybody. Roger has also written this book, 20 Things That Would Make the News Better, based on his experience at the BBC. I've read it and I highly recommend it to everybody. And today we'll be giving a signed copy of this book to one of you at the end of this episode. If you want to participate, just write in the comments section your first name and, your, and the hashtag better news, right? So over there, hashtag better news to get a copy of Roger's book at the end. We'll do a giveaway then. Roger, there's a lot that you cover in this book, um, but I wanted to start on the issue of impartiality. What does impartiality mean to a broadcaster like the BBC? It's a very good question, Conrad, and it's really fundamental. And I think that there's no easy single definition of the word impartiality. But what, it, what it represents is a sum of a whole set of values. And the values include things like fairness and honesty and accuracy and seeking truth. And if you put all those together and aspire to those, you end up with something fairly close to impartiality. But I, I know some people in the BBC now define it as not being biased. And that's also quite helpful if you think about it. Some newspapers and commercial media organisations are deliberately biased. They have a point of view. If you aspire to represent all people and all different points of opinion, in that case, that again gets you to something that is more like impartiality, which is not taking one side against another. So it's, it's not an easy definition, but I think you know it when you see it, to use that, uh, that terrible old cliché. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I can see some people are uh, putting in the hashtag. I just have to make people where you have to put better news as one word. So there shouldn't be a space. So I think Lawrence, uh, if you can do another comment with hashtag better news as one word, that'd be great. Roger, coming back to this thing about impartiality, this was one, I think, thing you could have written an entire book about and you, you only had space for one chapter. But I, I think you quoted someone as saying that impartiality has been confused or conflated to mean just some kind of false balance. What, what do you understand to mean that, that what, does, what does that mean, false balance? Well, there's a, a trope at the moment which says that the BBC gives equal time. You know, impartiality means equal time on climate change. But you have some people saying human-made climate change is a thing and some people not. And I, I just don't think that's true. I mean, I employed Roger Harabin, one of the most uh, committed environmental reporters, probably 30 years ago now. And if you look at people like him and David Shukman and Justin Rowlett now, they are not, um, they're not saying that climate change isn't happening. They're saying climate change is happening and it's urgent. And therefore, the truth is important. So that's why it's not about balance, it's about seeking truth. Now, 
Within that, it is possible that at some time, as famously happened on the Today programme at one point, you might put one voice on air, which happened to be Nigel Lawson, saying that human-made climate change may not be having the effect that some people think. That's an opinion. But in terms of what the BBC and other independent broadcasters, uh, public service broadcasters report, there is no doubt that human-made climate change is something that is real and happening. And there's no need to be balanced about that. It's a fact. Hmm. I think in the book you mentioned about the coverage of Brexit and that I think the BBC got a lot of flack from all sides about how Brexit was covered. So do you feel that the BBC coverage of Brexit was, in your definition, impartial or could, how could it have been improved? Well, this is going to be quite a slightly long answer. Um, first of all, I think that the BBC and public broadcasters in the UK didn't really understand the country. They didn't know enough about what was happening outside London. And I think it's quite easy to have a metropolitan view in which London as a remain voting city, you have a set of um, assumptions about the way people feel about the EU, which were not actually shared, as we now know, in Sunderland or in Morecambe or in other places around the UK. So I think there was a lack of understanding. Once you actually get to reporting the Brexit campaign, what I think most broadcasters did was go into what I call robotic balance, in which David Cameron would say one thing and Nigel Farage would say the other. You weren't given any steer on that. You weren't given any analysis about which was more likely to be speaking the truth. And I think in this case, um, I've tried this formula on a few people and people seem to generally buy it. The overwhelming consensus is that the economists said that Britain would be worse off if it left the EU. And that seems to be 95 percent of economists would argue that. And therefore, I think it's perfectly reasonable for the BBC and other broadcasters to say 95 percent of people think that the economy would suffer outside the single market. However, it's also true that if you think that sovereignty is the most important thing, if you think that the United Kingdom making its own laws and not having, um, as its critics would see it, undemocratic decision-making imposed from Brussels, well, in that case, it's perfectly legitimate to argue that you would like to leave anyway because you think independence is more important than 1% on GDP. And I think that wasn't really represented. And at times, even the sovereignty argument was balanced. And people said, well, you know, we're in NATO or we're in uh, the UN, so we are not sovereign in that regard. And there's no doubt that you are more sovereign if you're outside the EU, just as economists would say, you'd be more prosperous in the EU. And I think that would have helped shape the debate more than this sort of yarboo soundbite culture, which is what we actually got during the 2016 campaign. Do you think that this kind of soundbite culture is driven by how we as consumers of media now, we look at tweets, we watch, tick, heaven forbid, TikTok videos, all this really bite-sized sort of thing, such that our attention spans are so short that something as complex as Brexit or immigration becomes very difficult to explain in broadcast news? That's true, but I think people want to know what the truth is. And um, to use one example from here at Selwyn, um, when I talk to the students, I say, do you read a daily newspaper? Most of them think oh, it's a mad question. Um, if I say to them, um, you know, do you watch a linear television bulletin? Uh, they don't. On the other hand, um, they see things on social media or reported around the place and want to know if it's true or not. And the fact that public service broadcasters, ITV, Sky, um, some of the American networks, the fact that they try to give you the truth, I think people do want to know what's accurate and what's fair. And on lots of the big decisions of today, um, the risk is that the snap judgments of social media and Twitter, which is basically people of my age shouting at each other, um, that that dominates, whereas actually sometimes you need analysis and a proper take on things. And issues in the world are increasingly complex. And therefore, the real risk is that we have glib, instant, quick answers on social media, while the problems we're trying to solve become more intractable. And I think that 
public broadcasters have an obligation to give you the detail and give you the facts so that we as citizens can make our minds up. And public broadcasting still reaches enormous numbers of people. The BBC reaches more than 90% of people every week. So therefore, there is an audience there which wants intelligent analysis and impartiality. You've touched on a lot of points, Roger, that uh, we'll pick up on. First, just wanted to give a shout out to some of the viewers today. So Aaron's watching from Surrey. Maninda's from India. Martin is watching from Toronto. We have Paolo from Brazil. Vicky is celebrating Lunar New Year this weekend. Uh, we've got Manoj from Ely, not too far from here. Troy's watching from Boston. Someone's watching from the second Cambridge, the newer one. Um, we've got Amir from Kuala Lumpur. And I think, yeah, we have Seal and Lawrence. And just a reminder, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments of YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever you're watching. Roger, you, you mentioned about how the BBC, when it covered Brexit, was very much kind of insular in terms of like reflecting a certain metropolitan view. And can you talk about how important it is to have diversity in the newsroom and what does diversity mean? Diversity means people of all different backgrounds and experiences. And it's one of the things I sometimes say to students in um, Cambridge should say, by the way, hello to everybody around the world. It's just amazing number of people joining and also happy new Lunar New Year from uh, me too. Um, but I, I sometimes say to people here in Cambridge, look at the difference in perception between people in Cambridge and people in Peterborough. And if you don't know Peterborough, Peterborough is about probably 30, 40 miles up the road. And Peterborough voted to leave the EU and Cambridge voted to stay. And Cambridge is a generally prosperous cosmopolitan city with an amazing range of people from all around the world and the world as seen in Peterborough may be much tougher in terms of the pressure on schools and hospitals and roads and services and the benefits of globalization and an international community may be less evident there and I think it's important to say that it doesn't mean that Cambridge is right and Peterborough is wrong it means that economic and social and other circumstances can give you a different view and if in your newsroom in London or D.C. or Los Angeles, wherever it is, if in your newsroom all the people come from that neighbourhood and they've all been to the same schools, and they've all been to the same universities, they are going to have a view that coalesces. And sometimes you need people to say, actually, based on my lived experience growing up in Glasgow or in my case, Bradford or other places, you have a different take on the world. And that, I think, is where sometimes the media is metropolitan and uncomprehending. I think it's true in the United States as well, where uh, the newsrooms are based in New York and DC and, the, and California. Um, the Trump revolution really happened in middle America. And if your newsroom had been based in Wisconsin, it might have had a different view to a newsroom based somewhere in Fifth Avenue. In one of our previous live streams, our alums who were in the print publishing news uh, industries, uh, just as Google was taking off, we're talking about how the whole internet basically made the business model of things like local and regional news very much uneconomical. How do you see someone like a public broadcaster continue to balance uh, views and news from different regions? Well, here is the challenge. Yeah, here's a challenge for the BBC and to some extent for ITV in the UK, and that they are still regionally based broadcasters and they do have very, very popular. I mean, actually, the, the number one TV show in the UK most nights is the regional news at half past six. So uh, those programs, Look North and Look East and all the other ones, get very, very big audiences. And the BBC has a commitment to be in the nations and regions, which is why it's very weird that the BBC wasn't better responsive to the Brexit tide. And I, I, I should emphasize here, it doesn't mean being sympathetic to it. It means knowing it's happening and understanding why. And when you talk to colleagues, which I did for the book in Lincolnshire, which is a, a rural county, not very far from Cambridgeshire, that people in Lincolnshire were 
going to vote for Brexit in big numbers and did. The local radio journalists knew that was happening, could spot it happening. But when they phoned London and said, uh, you know what, um, there's a big Brexit tide here, people in London said, well, actually, no, we, we don't think so. We think it's going to be OK for Remain. So th there is that difference in perception. And it's really, really important that a, a public broadcaster keeps its local roots. And if you're uh, an American network, America has been a bit better than us at um, you know CNN being based originally in Atlanta and so on. But... Um, you cannot get a view of big and complex countries like India or, or China or anywhere from only the capital. You have to know what's happening all around the country. Mm. I'm reminded of this set of uh, interviews, I think, that local, BBC local radio journalists did, I can't remember, a couple of months ago. And it was amazing how good they were as journalists. And people seemed surprised that actually you got quality journalists outside London. Um, but, Roger, how has the BBC increased diversity in the newsroom? Well, so, some of it. There's been great strides in recent years to get better um, ethnic diversity and gender diversity and people of different sexualities and genders. And that's all a very good thing. The, the, I'm, I'm happy to see newsrooms which uh, look like modern Britain. But there are still challenges. I think the socioeconomic one is there. Uh, I, I, I mean... I used to run a program called The World at One on Radio 4, and um, I was very proud of what we did journalistically. But I think everyone at that time pretty much was 20, 30-something. We'd pretty much all been to university. Uh, we pretty much all lived in London. And therefore, uh, making sure that your diversity includes the whole of the UK. And it's harder now to get roots into London journalism from um, outside because house prices are difficult. There has been some very good work by the BBC in establishing big centres in uh, Salford, in Greater Manchester, and in Glasgow, and in Cardiff, and I hope that continues. We've also got to make sure then that the people missing sometimes might be people from the towns of England. And I think it's important to say that diversity um, means views of all kinds. So um, I've, I've sometimes said that the BBC can be a bit liberal, which goes with being metropolitan. It's also not very good at reflecting conservative religious views. So if you're a conservative Muslim or a religiously conservative uh, evangelical Christian, um, you probably don't find your views represented very much on mainstream media. Um, and that should be the case. You, you need to understand. So you may have, if you're a broadcaster or a an organization, you may want to have a small L liberal view of the benefits you can bring to the world, but you have to take the views of people who don't agree with that seriously and make sure they're represented on air. Hmm. I think we can take this question from Amir from KL, and I'm going to try to interpret the question. Amir asks, does better news necessitate impartiality? What if in cases where being impartial means giving equal voices? to value-destroying opinions. Uh, I'm not too sure what Amir uh, means by value-destroying opinions, but Roger, what's your take on this? I'm going to interpret what I think Amir means, mm. and let me uh, reflect on a moment in uh, uh, the late 2000s when uh, the BBC put on air on the Question Time programme um, a man called Nick Griffin, who has deeply odious views, and at the time was leader of the British National Party. And it was a big debate within the BBC about whether views of that kind, which I think are value-destroying opinions, should they be allowed on a big popular programme like Question Time? And actually, um, Nick Griffin shriveled under the spotlight. And the wonderful Bonnie Greer and Jack Straw, who at the time was a cabinet minister um, and a panel, took Nick Griffin apart. And I wouldn't say that was the moment when the BNP... Um, imploded, but it was certainly seen as being a very crucial part in its decline. And a huge audience watched that night. And Nick Griffin did not land any opinions which people bought or or it didn't set any, any, any train of support running. And I think that's where if you do have views which are inimical, the, the best thing for Nick Griffin would have been to have been banned from Question Time. If he'd been banned from Question Time, he'd have said, you know, the mainstream media won't let me on, I'm not allowed my views, I'm a martyr. Put him on, ask him questions, he can't answer them, and thankfully that kind of person disappears. 
Mm. Thanks, Roger. And Amir, I hope that answered your question. Um, coming back to this idea of diversity, you wrote in the book how it's important to have a diverse newsroom that reflects the country. But you also warned about the risks when employee representative groups start to expand their remit into influencing editorial matters. Um, can you talk, talk a bit more about what that means and how do you, where do you draw the line between, let's say, employees coming to a place, an organization, and wanting that organization to reflect their own values and purpose? And, and I understand that. And I, I, I should say that, um, um, you know, I, I am a, a social liberal and I, I was, as it happens, a, a remain voter in the in a referendum. So I don't have any personal acts to grind here. But I think that it is sometimes difficult to say that um, you have the views of an organization. The, 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 in the organization, you want people to feel supported and safe and secure in their jobs. But that sometimes means that you have to put people on there you disagree with. The most obvious example is you may have someone with a Palestinian background who puts the Israelis on there and someone with a Jewish background who puts the Palestinians on there. That's what you do in broadcasting. You put views on there that you don't necessarily agree with. And I think um, the, the BBC has a very proud role in gay issues on television. They had a famously a, a gay kiss in a soap opera decades ago. And I think the BBC's record there is very good. However, in the sort of 2018, 2019, the BBC um, allowed its employee networks to take part in a programme which said that they should give more supportive journalism to gay rights issues and be more understanding. Now, the BBC, as we know from the latest census, probably has three or four times the national average of gay employees. And that's fine. It's a creative industry. There's no reason that shouldn't be the case. But the idea that the journalism should be more supportive means that if you're looking at an issue like, um, I mean, the current one this week, uh, same-sex marriage in church, um, it doesn't mean, I think, that the BBC shouldn't represent both views in that debate. And it shouldn't start from the principle that it is automatically right for the Church of England to grant same-sex marriages because there is a, you know, I don't agree with myself, but there is a viable theological argument that it shouldn't, and that needs to be represented too. And impartiality means testing both sides of the argument and not being supportive of one. I'm going to ask a question that's a bit out of the broadcast news plot, but it's picking up upon this idea of employees having, you know, obviously wanting to want to have a diverse range, but also thinking, how do you present and look at issues? How in, in Cambridge, we want to have a vibrant intellectual place to have a vibrant intellectual debate. How do you create um, an, a space where that kind of vigorous debate can be can happen at the same time when people are also asking for safe spaces that they don't feel uh, threatened by certain views or values? Well, I have a certain amount of sympathy for the outgoing vice chancellor at Oxford who said that um, we should all learn to tolerate views uh, we don't like very much. And I think there are times, I, I say to our students when they come in, you will hear views during a time at university that you don't like. And I'd be quite disappointed if you didn't hear some views you don't like. I, I think, though, the really important thing is context. And I mentioned um, Nick Griffin and the experience on Question Time. And I did say in a, in a Cambridge meeting a couple of years ago, I said, I think any view that you can put on the BBC should be a view that you can hear in Cambridge University. And I think that is a reasonably good starting point. And somebody said, I think very wisely, yes, but the BBC does give context and does give a framework. So what you don't do is you don't put Nick Griffin onto Question Time for 60 minutes with no questions and nobody to challenge him. And I think that that challenge of views is very important and the framework in which you put it. And I would hope that in Cambridge we can have more rational debates, but the rational debate, it needs good moderation. It needs people to understand what the debate is going to be about. And then I think you can express views and articulate them more clearly. Because the, the problem sometimes is that views become a taboo 
before they're put, when sometimes you don't know what the view actually is, what the opinion is. And, it, and it's frustrating because you need to know if people say, we want rights for X group now, what are the rights you actually want? What are the problems at the moment that meet, make you need those rights? What would the impact be on other groups? And all that's interesting. It's part of making society work. And I, I don't like the idea there are no-go areas um, so I hope that we can have a civil discourse within that kind of framework. Yes, Aaron, I think said that's a good standard. I think that's the comment you made that if it can be debated in Cambridge, it can go on to the, the BBC. Um, we have a question from Troy. It's quite a general one. And he asks, Roger, have you noticed the shift in mainstream values over the course of your career in the media? Um, I'm, I'm not sure about values. I think that views of stories change over time. And I think it's important to say that um, although I don't obsess about um, liberalism with a small L in London, but um, there is no doubt that views can become fixed, whether they're apparently from the left or from the right. So to take one example, at the moment, it seems to me that we are close to where we were in 1996, 97, in thinking that the correct answer for an incoming Labour government is not to raise taxes. And the whole framework of the incoming Blair government in 1996-7 was to stick with Tory spending plans and not to increase tax. And at the moment, you're seeing that same thing being applied to Keir Starmer. And, and I, I'm slightly nervous saying this on a, an audience of economists, but I saw, um, or a judge business school said of people, but... I saw the other day, um, I think in the UK, 33% of GDP uh, is consumed by taxation. In France, it's 45%. So therefore, there must be a debate somewhere about, well, actually, could it be 35%, 36% in the UK, giving you a better service of standard public services? But the framework which the media have set is that um, tax rises are bad and um, equally nationalization is another example where the research we did when I was still in the BBC showed there was actually quite a lot of support for nationalization of water and electricity uh, but that was almost never a view you heard on the Today program or Newsnight actually the public were there so when I say that the broadcasters didn't understand the Brexit voters they didn't understand people who might have had some sympathy for some of Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald's program either. So, Roger, how would you suggest broadcast news or news be able to frame those kind of issues and be uh, use that incredible reach to have that sort of con slow, considered approach to quite complex things? It's always test the narrative. And the narrative um, is the way that all the broadcasters think on a particular day and the media do too. And the worst example of the thing I, I can't bear in a way is um, those people who shout questions in Downing Street. So when the Prime Minister comes out of the door and they say, um, you know, is the party over Prime Minister? You know, he's not going to answer that question. Um, it's just the media pack have decided that is the story of the day. Um, that's a bit they're going to use in the news later on to make the Prime Minister look a bit daft when he goes off. And um, sometimes, actually, the story may be, um, you know, the best example, which I, I, I lifted it from the Times, um, a sketch by Quentin Letts. But when Boris Johnson went to India while Partygate was running, there were all sorts of fascinating things that happened during Boris Johnson's trip to India and talk of a trade deal, uh, talk about environmental initiatives, talk about international trade. And all the journalists wanted to ask about was Partygate and had someone had any cake there the week before. And, and I, so Partygate is very, very important. It held the Prime Minister's fate in his hands. But actually, British-Indian relations were jolly important too, and they should have been reported. So I think if you're a journalist, test the narrative. Don't always stick with the same agenda. And I think one of the more depressing things now, which goes back to the previous question, is that probably the media move more as a pack now. So social media goes all over the place, but the mainstream media tend to have the same stories in pretty much the same order. And that is almost certainly wrong on some days. And I'd hope the public service broadcaster will say, actually, you know what? We've done that story for now. Let's do something else that's more important. Um, let's look at plastic pollution in the oceans today uh, rather than day 73 of did Keir Starmer have a drink in Durham or not? I, I think it was John Stewart who 
on his show castigated American media for going to town on the Mueller report for two years while it was ongoing and nothing was 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 coming out because Mueller is a very tight-lipped person and uh, when it came out they were like oh god it's a thousand pages and I need to get something out quickly right and of course there was no consideration about all the fine nuances and that a thousand pages are just wasted but coming to this point about um, the mainstream media moving as a pack we have a question from someone on LinkedIn. How do you interpret the rise of alternatives to the BBC, such as GB News? I'm in favour. I'm, I'm in favour of some outlets having an opinion. Um, I mean, my worry about the United States in particular is that now it's so dominated by Fox News on the right and MSNBC on the liberal side of the argument that, that the, the mainstream organisations look a bit um, torpid by comparison, uh, whereas the UK and most of Europe still have a public service broadcasting model where the public broadcasters like um, ARD and ZDF in Germany have still got quite a big clout. Uh, so I don't want you to go imbalanced, but if you do have GB News um, biting the BBC's ankles. I don't think that's a bad thing. And uh, you do have equivalents on the left of um, the Canary or, uh, or other media organisations which are taking a, a left view. What I think would be a disaster is if you're only left with partisan organisations. Um, but GB News has done some um, interesting and um, uh, creative things. And I wish there was um, quite nice to have a uh, a liberal left model, which was um, more the equivalent. Uh, but I suppose you could argue that, um, you know, GB News is going into where it sees there at the moment as being a, a market gap. Mm. This being, you know, hosted by Judge Business School, I have to ask you an economics type question, which is, do you think that a place like the UK, we have to continue where uh, a situation where you have a publicly funded broadcasters like the BBC, or should we completely let it, let the free market run, like very much like in the US, uh, and let the market decide how responsible news should be produced? Well, I think you need market interventions here. And I suppose I would say this as a journalist, but I think that news is the most obvious example. Conrad, you, you mentioned earlier local news and the decline in local news. And I, I used to, when I lived in uh, London, I, my local paper was the Richmond and Twickenham Times. When I last looked online at it, it was a whole load of news about um, you know, clickbait from here, there and everywhere and stories from southeast London. And local news has largely disappeared from print and from local radio, commercial local radio. So you need um, a license fee intervention to provide local and I believe regional news. And I think increasingly um, the BBC's role as somebody bringing impartial news to the country uh, will again need support from public services, from public uh, taxation. I think there are two things really. One is I do accept an argument that says that um, some genres, especially drama, you are now getting very good content from streamers and they clearly are putting huge amounts of money into content, some of which is directed at UK or different countries' audiences. Um, so I think, um, you know, the argument that you need public broadcasting for drama still has to be fought. I think you can argue that something like if you're enjoying Happy Valley on BBC One on a Sunday evening, could a commercial streamer have made that? I, probably not. Um, but the drama is getting a bit trickier to make the argument. Mm. Um, but I, I think for people less familiar with the UK debate, um, it's a bit like the National Health Service, which is that um, you hope you don't need the National Health Service, but the idea that you should put money into something which provides a safety net and a service or people wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it, um, I think equally applies to broadcast media, where there is a, a general national good from having something which is uh, not commercially driven and not at risk that it mm. disappears because there's no funding for local content. Mm. Some really great points. And Roger actually covers a lot more in his book. So if you want a copy of Roger's book, we're giving one copy away at the end. Just put in the comments field if you haven't done so already. Hashtag better news as one word. Um, 
Roger, I think I was gonna. I wanted to ask you though. We most of us we don't we've never been in a newsroom. We don't work in the media, and you talk a lot about the importance of an editor in terms of figuring out the framework, what news to cover, what news to be given more priority. Can you share with us what does an editor do? It's a very good question. I, I suppose the the vogue term that people use is about curation. Um, there's a whole load of stuff out there. There are a million stories in the world every day. So what an editor does is bring you what they believe and their team believe to be the most important stories. As I say, there is a, um, a, a journalistic consensus quite a lot of days that the most important stories are uh, Ukraine, followed by climate change, followed by whatever. And sometimes I think good editors will break out of that and give you something different and say that we think this is really important. And um, there is an element of personal choice there. So I accept there is a, a filter which you may or may not like. And there was one day when uh, one of my friends said to me uh, when I was editing the Today programme, this morning's program bore the imprint of every single one of your obsessions. And I was I was sort of a bit wounded and offended, thinking, oh my goodness. But he said no, it was good because you you have this sense that there is a questioning intelligence in the program, and that the program is seeking out truths and answers on these issues. And I think if you have enough diverse editors across the output, I think if the whole world was uh, you know, Roger Mosey's view, it would be a pretty drab and weird world. Um, so actually, you need lots of strong editors too. And you, you see that in the best people. So Ben De Pair on Channel 4 News or Esme Wren when she was on Newsnight. There are editors who are great within their organizations who make their programs very distinctive. And you may sometimes think, hang on, I'm not sure that was quite right. But it's part of a diversity of opinion in news. And what is a problem, I think, is if you get a homogeneity of news, which is just one big machine with one person taking the decisions. And in that case, you are going to end up with a rather anodyne, um, you know, monolithic view of the world that isn't as good as lots of editors doing their stuff. And kind of related to that, we have a question from Vicky, who asks, how... Roger, is there any suggest what suggestions do you have for ordinary people like us to make ourselves less impartial, to increase our diversity of views and avoid that coalescence of views that you mentioned? Um, one of my old bosses, Mark Byford, when he was Deputy Director General of the BBC, used to say that he would spend a couple of hours every day just reading um, the op-eds and the wires and the agency content and trying to make sure he got as wide a view of stories as possible. And it's certainly something that the BBC did with some success was having masterclasses in particular subjects. So as, as an editor or as a journalist, you know often uh, a little about a lot. And if you can sometimes bring in a great expert like Carrie Gracie on China or bring in, uh, you know, distinguished academics who can join you, they can give you a whole eye opening view of a different world. And you need to keep trying to do that. So always challenge yourself. Do I know enough about this? Or if I read different comments and I, I found it um uh, most of the coverage of Ukraine by broadcast news has been very good indeed. Um, but I found that the broadcasters tended, certainly in the early days, to operate through a framework which said uh, the Russians are bearing down on Kiev and um, there's going to be an invasion and it's going to happen very soon and Zelensky will be deposed. It was only when you read the expert advice, often in newspapers or websites, that said the tanks are bogged down in mud, um, the weather's terrible, um, they can't get the supply lines going. And that is a very, very important part of the story and turned out to be very significant. Um, so you've always got to be looking for the extra information and the an analysts that will give you the extra bit of gen that's going to make your reporting more distinctive. Mm. Well, while you're trying to get back in, we did the giveaway and um, Seal will get a signed copy of your book. So I'll talk to you, Sheila, in your office and get, get you uh, to sign a copy for her. Okay, that's great. Um, Congratulations, Seal. Thanks for being there. We had very quickly a couple, two really good questions. One really good question here. I was going to say it took half an hour before someone asked about AI and ChatGPT. So, Roger, do you have any concerns 
with the chat GPT, I guess, in the context of journalism? It's a very good question from Lawrence. I haven't really thought about it in terms of journalism. I, I, I hope that the, the, the human touch will still be important. Um, and clearly, a AI is going to be, um, you know, continue to revolutionize our world. But I think journalism does have an important personal element about it. And I'm not being ashamed of that. I think that bringing yourself to work is important as long as you challenge yourself all the time. I think bringing yourself to work and saying, this is my view of the world um, and I don't care what other people think is terrible. Um, but if you have that element of yourself constantly intellectually challenged by your colleagues and by your audience, um, that's great. Yeah, I think things like a some, some of these AI models could probably replace some of the more mundane aspects of journalism, maybe more on the print side. So uh, a sports report, for example, uh, you know, yeah, what happened in the game, I maybe. <laughs> I, I just hope, as an Arsenal fan, I would program the AI to um, say that Arsenal should win the league. So that would be my um, my contribution. Well, I, I have to say I support the correct team in North London, results notwithstanding. So, let's leave, <laughs> let's leave. but I wanted to end with uh, this this comment by Erin. Um, so she's looking to switch into media. Roger, what's your advice to people thinking of a career in journalism at this point in time? It's a very good question again, and I, I, I have two views which sound contradictory and probably are. One is, of course, since I started, everything has changed. Um, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have mobile phones, we didn't have a whole range of things. Um, and the idea of social media would have been really bizarre. <laughs> On the other hand, when I talk to students who are going into the media, um, they're facing many of the same issues and they have many of the same opportunities. And we had a Selwyn student recently who went to work as a trainee on the Telegraph. I've known people who've gone into uh, the BBC. One of our uh, alumni at Selwyn is now uh, working on the Laura Koonsberg show on a, Saturday, on a Sunday morning. And, and that's incredibly similar to what I did 30 or 40 years ago. So... I think you have to adapt to new platforms, but the core of journalism, about what journalism is about, seems to me still to be there. And the careers are, again, remarkably similar. I think full tribute to The Telegraph and other people who run trainee schemes. Or actually, you can do what, what I did, which was um, not really go through a trainee scheme, but actually um, start freelancing in local radio and being the chap who used to run around getting the travel news and um, carrying the sports results through to the presenters and get yourself some experience. And the only thing I would say if you're looking at careers is um, occasionally someone will come to me and say, I'd like to work in media and I'd like, to, I'd like to make films. And I say, what have you done? And they say, well, nothing yet. And given the amount of media there is around... There's no real excuse for having done nothing. And whether it's um, blogging or your own social media or a bit of reporting student press, there are things you can do that show you're going to be keen and active. And uh, I would recommend it. It's a great career to go into. Roger, thank you so much for all that sharing with us. Um, for those people who you know, want to know, want to keep up with what Roger's doing, you can follow him at Roger Mosey on Twitter. Is that right, Roger? I got that? Uh, yeah, it's at, at, at Roger Mosey. And I'm, I'm on LinkedIn as well. So if you're watching via LinkedIn, um, I'm somewhere on LinkedIn. So do do search. And I'm very happy. I mean, actually, my my um, uh, Cambridge email, if anybody wants to get in touch uh, directly, is um, rm for Roger Mosey, rm725 at cam.ac.uk. So the regular Cambridge email address, I'm rm725 as a uh, CSID. So, um, I think that's it, right? RM seven two five at cam. Yeah, UK. yeah, that's very quick. Your graphics are really good, Conrad. There's a career there, I think. So, I know, I know. I... <laughs> but thank you so much, Roger, and thank you all to our viewers. As I said, our next episode uh, will feature our faculty, Chris Marquis. He's a faculty member here at CJBS, and he's written a book, another book, right, about Mao and markets. He talks about how China's economic development owes a lot more to communist ideology than most Western pundits think. So if you can join me and um, Chris, 
not next Friday, but the Friday after, on the 3rd of February, at a slightly later time, 4 p.m. UK time, that would be great. So with that, I leave, it just leaves me to thank you, the viewers, thank Roger as well for giving, me, giving us his time, and look forward to seeing all of you very soon. Thank you so much. Um, stay well.